Welcome everyone. Uh, I want to be mindful of everyone's time so we can get started. Thank you for joining us uh, and making this a record-breaking turnout in the Remind Assembly series. The Remind Assembly series is a series of events periodically hosted by Remind where we bring together diverse mission-driven professionals in technology to share their ideas. And for today's installment, we've prepared a panel of amazing EdTech leaders from a variety of companies uh, who have a wide range of experiences and backgrounds, and they all share one thing in common. Uh, they all worked in education in previous careers. So somewhere at the school level or district level, as well as nonprofits. Uh, and I'm sure we'll find that many folks in the audience today have similar backgrounds and can learn from their collective experiences. I've actually gotten to know this group, uh, and I know I would have loved to chat with them when I was thinking about getting into ed tech several years ago. So let's do some quick introductions of the group, and Leanne, I'll let you take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, really happy to be here with you all, and I'm super excited about this, this turnout. We have a lot of people still coming into the room. Uh, my name is Leanne Trujillo. Uh, I currently work as a program manager of academic and educational programs at Twitter. Um, I started my career as a high school teacher, uh, special education, and social studies and ethnic studies in the South Bronx, uh, New York City Public Schools. Uh, I worked for a short time as a Dean of Students, um, did some coaching throughout the NYC DOE, um, and actually uh, Got, went back to school full time to get a master's degree in, in policy um, and spent some time uh, before transitioning into the tech world, working in uh, po ed policy and research, um, which, which led me to my, to my role today. And actually um, worked, my first transition into tech was actually at Remind. So this is a little bit of a homecoming for me. So super excited to be here with you all today. Excellent, thank you, Leanne. Uh, Galen, would you go next? Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Galen Spindell. Um, I am currently an engineering manager here at Remind. Um, and I actually started in education. I was a seventh grade math and science teacher. I taught in Hawaii, um, which was pretty fantastic. I taught on a military base, um, which was a really interesting experience, um, you know, with a big transient population. Um, I initially made the switch into tech because I was doing Khan Academy's Hour of Code with my students. I realized that I was just as in into it as they were. Um, so I did some research to figure out kind of what that meant and what that looked like. Um, I ended up doing a coding boot camp here in San Francisco. Well, I'm not in San Francisco right now, but I used to be um, in San Francisco. Um, and then did a brief internship at a machine learning uh, company for online fraud and have been at Remind for the past four years. So really grew my tech career at Remind, um, which is where I am now. Excellent, thank you, Galen. Megan, uh, would you mind going next? Sure thing. Uh, my name is Megan Thompson. I am currently with IXL Learning. I'm one of our district partnership specialists there and work with our um, districts on their implementation with the program. And I started in 2008 as a high school special education teacher and then went from there to middle school, math and ELA, and then was a middle school administrator um, in Louisiana, and then now am uh, working for IXL. And found IXL because of, it was something I used in my classroom. Glad to, have, glad to uh, hear more about, about that, uh, Megan. Uh, Daniel, you're the next talking head on my screen, so I'll go to you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Daniel Hahn. I currently am a senior project manager at Course Hero. Uh, I spent about three years in the classroom in Las Vegas and one year uh, in the classroom abroad in the Middle East. Uh, after that, I got my foot in the door with uh, EdTech with a uh, company called MobyMax feature uh, focusing on K-8. Uh, now I work in the college space uh, with Course Hero. Very excited to be here. Thanks, Daniel. And Doug, you're next on my list. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Uh, Doug Conopelko. Uh, I was a high school science teacher, high school assistant principal, um, district uh, instructional technology director, uh, a couple other things along the way as well. And now I am an education strategist at CDW. Uh, so I work with school districts that are implementing different programs uh, across the southeast. So I cover Florida, Georgia and Tennessee. Excellent. Thanks, Doug. And last, last but definitely not least, Georgia. 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Georgia Davis and I'm a product designer at Clever. Um, and I started um, as a teacher in Baltimore City. I taught sixth grade ELA and social studies. Um, and then I taught a year in DC. I taught dance, which was very different, but also fun. Um, and I made my transition to tech by um, getting into course development, actually. I created um, content for a online boot camp and then um, kind of found my way into a design career by working alongside other designers. Um, and yeah, I've uh, kind of tried a lot of things along the way, but um, love product design and love working in the tech space. Excellent. Thanks, Georgia. I love how everybody's experiences kind of run the, run the gamut. Uh, so we'll definitely, definitely interested to, to learning, uh, to hearing about your experiences in education and transitioning to ed tech. I'll be the host today. My name is Eric Reichenbacher. I'm a former high school English teacher from here in San Francisco uh, at San Francisco Unified School District. Uh, if you can tell from my picture in the background. Uh, after teaching, uh, I took a pretty non-linear path. I think that's a theme we'll hear a lot about today. Uh, I actually attended law school and worked in law for a couple years before finding a home in ed tech here at Remind. Um, so I've been here almost five years now and I am a sales manager for our West region. Before we get to some questions for the panelists, I actually have a question for the audience. Can you please raise your hand if you feel even slightly guilty about being on this call? Um, I know I did uh, when I was thinking about leaving education, so I think that is totally normal. Teaching and education in general can be extremely challenging, especially right now. Uh, but it can also be hard to start thinking about leaving teaching. We all got into teaching and education because we wanted to have a positive impact on the world and students' lives. In many ways, once you're a teacher, you're always a teacher. But the reality is that almost 50% of new teachers stop teaching after five years. And the average worker in America will have 12 to 15 jobs in their lifetime. So many folks have made this transition before and hearing from their experiences and what they learned along the way is exactly why we're here. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into some questions for our panelists. Uh, and I have about four main areas of questions and I'd first like to start with how people decided to get into ed tech. Uh, something I'm always curious about and the first question I'll ask is how did you make the decision to take the plunge and begin your move from education to ed tech? What interest you, interested you about the space? Uh, maybe we could hear from someone who had a more direct route to ed tech and someone who had more of a nonlinear path uh, like myself. So anybody feel free to jump in. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go. Uh, mine was definitely a direct path, but um, unintentional. I decided that um, I was looking for some opportunities outside of the classroom um, and was looking in uh, nonprofit work and wasn't getting any traction. Um, shortly after I returned from a year abroad in the Middle East teaching, um, my, my first ed tech company reached out to me called MobyMax. Um, I was a little skeptical if they were even in fact a company at first, um, but uh, really opened my eyes to the world of ed tech. It hadn't been something I was too familiar with. I wasn't actively seeking it. Um, which is a shame because there's so many opportunities for educators in this field. Um, I think my biggest takeaway from that is uh, I just wish I had been researching and, and looking for opportunities and had had guidance, uh, similar, something similar to this, uh, in order to even know where to begin. So um, mine was definitely direct, but uh, unintentional. So it was a little, it was a little interesting. Yeah, I you know, I, I told part of that story in my intro, like I got into tech because of my students, because like doing our code with them. Um, so really my entrance into ed tech was less about the ed part and more I knew I wanted to get into tech. Mm -hmm. um, so I did my coding boot camp, And actually when it came to finding a job, I was actively avoiding ed tech when I first started job searching. And that was because I had spent three years in the classroom with so many apps that were gonna change education. And I was really annoyed. I was like very jaded by that type of ed tech, which is what I thought everything was. Um, the reason I ended up at Remind is because I was talking to the founders and I 
I realized that remind was something I would have used in my classroom and it would have changed how I interacted with my kids. Right. And I interviewed a bunch of other places, you know, I got other offers and I just like couldn't stop thinking about remind um, because for me working on something that I cared about was so important. We spend so much of our time working and I need to be motivated to like get up and do what I do every day. Right. So I couldn't shake that teacher side of me. Um, it really took finding the right, um, the right company uh, to, to bring you back to. I can go next. I'm probably on the uh, more of the non-linear side that Eric referred to. So I had no intentions really directly of going into the tech space at all. Um, after I uh, stopped teaching, I went back to pursue a full-time master's degree in education policy. And part of the reason and at my core, uh, what's still true today is I got into education uh, for equity um, and to champion equity um, and to tackle some of the thorny issues that we're seeing um, in society. And that's still true today. Um, how I transitioned from, um, when I got out of grad school, I actually uh, started um, in education research um, and, and working at an education nonprofit who I actually see some of y'all that I used to work with here today, so hello. Um, and actually made my first transition into tech um, because it uh, was a tool that I had, had used in the classroom and I saw that the company had also done some things around educational equity. And so that's how I first made my way in. And I have to say it was through my network. Um, actually, Eric, the host here today, um, we went to the same uh, university for undergrad. I didn't know him at all, but I was like, hey, I see this guy, um, you know, maybe there's a way I can reach out to him through my network. And so uh, having somebody that was already in the space to, to bring me in um, really helped. And so now I find myself in a role where I'm getting to work um, in a little bit of research policy and, and equity um, maybe not in a very straightforward way, maybe not in the way that I had initially planned, but I find myself here today. Excellent, excellent. Before we kind of continue, I think it's one thing we talked about uh, before with some of the panelists is I think it's important to kind of define the space. We talk about ed tech, like what, what is that? We have folks here from you know, mid-sized startups, Doug at a Fortune 200 company, Leanne, who has worked in ed, education, ed tech, and now at, now at uh, Twitter in, in an ed research role. Um, can someone kind of help give kind of our audience kind of a broad overview of the types of companies they might, uh, they, they might see out there in the ed tech landscape? landscape? Yeah, I, I think two things kind of come to mind and that I think Leanne's a great example of this, right? Because there's two different sides to it. I think there's like education companies that are involved with tech. And then there's also tech companies that have education related roles within them, right? So I think um, while Leanne, when she first talked to us was talking about, you know, she doesn't feel like it's a typical ed tech role, right? But it is definitely an education based role at a technology company where the skills of being an educator are really useful. Excellent. And what, what did folks kind of consider uh, when looking at different companies in ed tech? And I know Galen, you were like, not, not ed tech at all. I wanna get away from that. But what did, what did people look at uh, when they were kind of researching different companies in the space um, to, to get into initially? I can start us off on that one. Um, Initially, I, I didn't know what to look for. I had done some freelance with a friend who worked for EdSight. And I, at the time, um, was completely unemployed. I had been in the classroom and in the school for quite some time, but I was unemployed. I was driving for Uber and Lyft. And then I was like, okay, it is time to look again for a full-time job. And a friend, I had been free, doing some freelance work with EdSight. And she said, you know, look on ed surge because i still i knew i wanted to do something with education and i knew that um i wanted to also be remote I, I really wanted to do the van life or rv life thing so that was all i knew and she was like go on ed surge click the remote box and then just look on look at jobs so at first you know i'm like applying to just everything i think there was one job i had no idea what the titles were and I got it, I, most of them didn't, you know, call back or anything, but I get one interview and in the middle of the interview, I realize I have no idea 
what this job actually is. And I'm thinking, should I just say that? And we should end this interview now because I know they have to be thinking the same thing. Uh, but then ultimately what I started to be more strategic and I was like, okay, hold on, let me think for a second. What did I use in my classroom? What programs did I really like? What was I invested in? Because then when I get on these interviews, if I get them, then I'm gonna be able to speak to the product and how it impacted my students and, and my classroom. And that allowed me to be a little bit more targeted. And then a friend uh, gave advice of, you know, make sure you're tweaking your cover letter and your resume based on the job descriptions of these companies. Don't just do a standard one. I didn't know that beforehand. Um, so there were just different things that, you know, it had been 12 years, I guess, since I had applied for a job. And it, there were things that I just didn't know, got on LinkedIn, some really practical things that then helped slowly put me in the spot that I'm now. Excellent. Yeah, I'd love to add to what um, Megan mentioned. I think um, for me, I didn't know what I wanted to do in tech, um, but I knew that as a teacher, I had a lot of transferable skills. So the first thing I did was connect with a lot of my friends who were teachers that transitioned in tech to see what kind of roles that they were doing. Um, and I realized like um, from the classroom, they were able to go into roles like recruiting or support, things that are not specific to ed tech, but are um, really applicable as a former teacher. Um, content development was the route I took. As a teacher, I wrote tons of lessons as you all did. And that's something that a lot of ed tech companies are looking for. Um, and so that was kind of my way into um, ed tech, but really the tech industry as a whole. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah I would- to Sorry, go ahead, Dick. I was going to say to play off of what Megan had said too about like the interview process, like I knew what I didn't want to do at the time, right? So I knew that I didn't want to be in sales, right? I knew I wanted to continue to work with school districts uh, because of the role that I was in at the district where I worked. I was in contact with all of these companies all the time because that was my role. Um, and, and I remember, so one of the things that I still hold true is like always apply and always go on the interview because you can always say no, or even if it's awkward, uh, like what Megan said, you may even think like in the middle of the interview, I already know. Um, but I, you can't go back afterwards and then decide that you do want to take the interview, right? You have to take those things as they come. And, you know, I think there were plenty of times, especially with somebody mentioned already, like the titles are really funky, right? Every, every, you can never tell what somebody does by their title. So I would go on the interview and, you know, it would be something that sounds like the role I have now, like a strategist or something. And then three questions into the interview and they're all about sales. And I would know, okay, this is actually a sales job. I know that I don't want this one and just kind of keep moving. Yeah, I would I, add, oh, go ahead. You go ahead, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, and going back to your original question, uh, when it came to you know making decisions of what kind of companies I wanted to apply to or what I was actually looking for, um, when I made my first kind of true application process to my next company after my uh, after MobyMax, I was really focused. You, you, in my opinion, you have to look on what what is your goal? Is your goal stability? Is your goal professional development or opportunity for yourself? Is is your goal value? Uh, the values of the company or the culture of the company? Um, and of course, some of those um, different areas can overlap. Uh, but for me personally, when I was looking for uh, my new role, which ended up being a course hero, um, I was really looking for opportunities to move my resume from just pure teaching and content, which content development is essentially, uh, think of it as like writing lesson plans or writing lessons or creating educational material. Uh, the tech word for that is content and then the ed tech is content development. You move it through to, to, to make it from start to finish. Um, so for me, it was growth. I, I really wanted to begin planning for my future career. You know, I, I had a really narrow resume and I wanted to branch out. So that meant for me is finding a smaller company that was a little, uh, little more scrappy um, because those companies, in my opinion, you have a lot more opportunity to quickly move. New needs happen in a second and all of a sudden you might have been their content specialist, but now you're on their marketing team or now you're in a boot camp for their engineering team. So uh, you can really take opportunities um, to, to grow your, your, your skills and experience. Um, 
Um, and just really quickly on values, um, especially coming from education, uh, the values of the company were really important to me. And one thing I'll say that I've noticed in my tech experience is that companies are very invested in their, in their values um, and living them um, not only outwardly, but inwardly. I was very shocked to see, you know, my company listed all their five values and they were constantly reinforced and like promoted and, and it wasn't just lip service. Like they wanted that to be integral to their culture. So look at those jobs and careers and about us pages of those companies. Most often than not, in my opinion, in tech, you're going to find they truly mean those things. So make sure you identify and believe in what they, what they're selling basically. You just took the word. I was going to, I figured you were going to touch on values. I was like, I'm going to let him take it. Uh, plus one to what Daniel said. I think uh, the values piece is super important because I hadn't, I didn't understand any of the titles. I was like, what is success here? This, that, and very transparently, like I stalked a lot of people. I know we're not supposed to use that word, but I stalked a lot of people on LinkedIn um, to understand like, okay, they have this title, but what type of skills are they employing and how that, how might that be different or are viewed differently at different companies? And in full transparency, I want to say I at least put in 80 applications, um, got a lot of no's, a lot of probably actually a lot of non-responses, but from all the ones that did respond to Doug's point is even if I wasn't quite sure, I took the interview to understand how they talked about things, what were the words that they were using to describe roles, and then back to Daniel's point, really understanding, does this place align with my values um, that have stayed the same uh, for me? And I would venture for almost everyone on this call throughout your career is, does this align? And really sussing that out. And you start to hone in on it as you go through more interviews, whether the interviews are good or bad. So I encourage you to shoot your shot and even if you're not sure, still go on the interview because you will learn some lessons along the way. I, I wanna get into some more of these like nitty gritty detailed recommendations for folks. Um, before we do that, I, I, I definitely wanna touch on, and I, I know we have some questions coming in around this, but really just the specific skills and experiences that, that you all have gained in education that are really transferable to careers in ed tech. And Galen, I'd actually like to start with you, if you don't mind, and just kind of interested in hearing from you first, like as someone, an engineer who's seemingly kind of pretty disconnected from education, uh, and then hear from others in, in what ways you, you draw from your education experience uh, in your role. Yeah, so I have like kind of two answers to this. One is as an engineering manager, which is what I do right now, all I'm doing is teaching they're adults and they're not 12, you know, and in some respects that's easier, in some respects that's harder, right? But I'm doing the exact same things. I am like breaking big concepts down into smaller concepts. I am checking for understanding. I'm like building relationships to get that trust right? So that I can align all of my people to one common goal, right? I, as a manager, truly, it is, it is so transferable. Um, as an engineer, I understand that that seems a little, a little more distant, um, but still breaking, like, that, that's the biggest thing that I always think of is breaking ideas down into, like, digestible chunks, breaking a big engineering project down into clear deliverables, Right? You can't say, hey, we're going to spend nine months and go build this thing. Right? That's not okay for leadership. That's not okay for the business. Here's this big thing we need to go build. Here are the 12 very clear components of it that we're going to start tackling. Right? That's just scaffolding. Um, the other big thing is, is, that, is that growth mindset, right? which all of us as teachers have to have. Um, and I immediately brought that in to engineering. You know, I came into remind really, really junior. I didn't know anything. I did a coding boot camp. I was in there with folks who had worked in the industry for 10 years and who had CS degrees from, you know, amazing places. And I was the one in meetings willing to be like, hi, you said something and I don't understand. Can we, can we backtrack there? Right. And that was a culture that didn't already exist within engineering because you know, you don't want to admit that you don't know something because there's all this pride around it, but I was very willing to cross that boundary, right? And that then got other people asking questions. If I didn't know, there's a very good chance someone else in the room doesn't know, right? And so in that, that question asking, that teaching, that learning, every single engineer at Remind 
has the opportunity to teach someone something and has the opportunity to learn something from someone else, right? And as a teacher, you're very comfortable with that concept and it's easier to bring other people in because if you're comfortable modeling it, they're gonna be more comfortable following that mindset. I would love to tag on to what Galen mentioned. Um, I think uh, as a designer, um, when I think back to being in the classroom, there are many things that are transferable, but there was still a lot of additional skills that I had to learn along the way to really feel confident as a designer, but really be qualified um, to be a product designer. Um, so I think that's also really important in thinking about what you want your first step to be um, when transitioning into ed tech. Um, do you, uh, are you looking for roles that you're qualified for and confident to take now, or do you want to gain more skills in order to uh, transition to a role that um, may not be something that you learned in the classroom. Um, so that, that, I think that's really important to think about just the next step. Um, you know, do you want to get a job in tech tomorrow with what you know now, or do you want to learn some additional skills to be in a more specific role? Um, but I would like to speak to some transferable skills as a designer. I think as a teacher, um, there would be days where I just failed miserably and my kids made it really obvious that I did. Um, and so I think being able to pick myself back up and come back the next day with a new lesson um, is often what I do as a designer. I am presenting my, my work, my designs in front of um, my team and uh, it's, I'm being invited to have that work torn apart and, and then kind of iterate and come back the next day with, with new designs. And so I think just being able to um, have a growth mindset, but really think uh, iteratively and not be afraid of failure and criticism and um, feedback, I think is really helpful for me to sharpen uh, my skills as a designer. Excellent, excellent. Thank yeah, you both for, go, go ahead, Doug. Oh, I was just gonna say the, the other thing that I thought of as, as Georgia was saying that is, you know, what she's talking about with the designer piece and having to present those every day, I think it brings like in really interesting, I, I don't know if I would call it a skill, but but the idea that as a teacher, like everything you do is sort of public, right? Everything you do, like every word that you say. And so I know that, um, you know, we talked in the past about some of these little stories, right? These things that happen in the classroom that you didn't know were a lesson or a skill yet, um, but then served you really well down the road. So that idea of, you know, my student who every day would tell me a number as he was walking out of the room, my first year teaching. And I was thinking, what is like, what is this kid talking about? And then sure enough, after four days of that, I said, hang on, like, what are you, what are you telling me? Like, is this a code? And he said, that's how many times you said, all right, today. And the numbers were large numbers, right? So I didn't realize that I had had this pause word and I didn't realize at the time that that was some kind of lesson that I was gonna carry with me. But now I'm very, very aware of that. And it served me really well when you're in a role uh, like I'm in now or some of the other folks on the call here where you do have to speak in front of people a lot or you go to conferences. It's really important and it really changes the way people perceive you. Uh, so those things as well are really important. And the other one I would add real quickly is just if you have areas that you're even slightly interested in, figure out what certifications are available within those and not necessarily even for the skills, but for the community. So when I got the, you know, Google level one, whatever they called it originally, it was less about the certification, but then you started to get like emails from them about who wants to volunteer to do X and just following those things and starting to build up experiences on your resume that aren't um, solely the classroom teaching, I think also helps. And real quickly, other than the EQ skills of like resilience and growth mindset, um, I found that some of the, like the things you're doing in the classroom are so applicable to what you're actually going to do every day in some of these roles. For example, uh, classroom management, like 
as a project manager, I'm managing like a lot of people, a lot of tasks. So even your classroom management, like how you think about that, how you plan it applies to, to my job. Um, just the planning in general, lesson planning, um, the, the building of materials, uh, think of like center management that you used to do, like seeing a really complex organization, it might not sound that complex, but I had 40 kids that I was effectively they're all cogs in a little machine. Um, all those skills were incredibly transferable. I just had to think a little bit more outside of the box. I saw them very narrowly. But then when I approached some of the work I was given, I was like, oh, like this is just like planning, uh, sprint planning, which is engineering work. It's, it's very similar to like planning your day in the classroom. So you can really start to leverage some of those skills very quickly. Plus one to all that. I'll also admit, I don't think I've ever told anyone this, I use the universal design uh, for learning framework every time I go to make a presentation at Twitter, which is pretty much three times a week where I have to influence decisions we're making via research from higher education. I use the UDL framework um, in my writing and presentations. I'll also admit, um, I like I said, educational equity was has always been at the forefront of what I've done. I still use a lot of the frameworks I learned from the school reform initiative when I'm managing meetings with adults and external stakeholders. They don't know that, uh, but a lot of the concepts, um, I think someone on here said they have different names, but they're essentially sometimes uh, the same thing. The one thing I have had to improve upon in my time in tech is learning the lingo and the language and employing code switching, which for any folks that are bilingual on this call come from a different background, like the skills of just code switching um, and working and, and being able to uh, like derive and, and make meaning um, are super important. And I, I found them very useful when working across, um, cross-functionally in an organization. Excellent. There's also a lot of people in ed tech that are not, that don't have an education background. And so I have found too, that there are just so many times where folks are designing something and then, you know, you'll look at it because you are a teacher think there's no way this is practical or this is not going to work. And so it really does take both the geniuses that are the software engineers and that have that background, as well as then the educators in the room to be able to say, this is how this program would look in a classroom right now. This is how it would actually look in communicating with, with students and families. Um, and I found that a lot of times there will just be moments where even on, in our team, you know, someone will say we need somebody with rural experience and what this would look like in a rural community. We need somebody with who is a sped has a sped background anybody. Uh, we need someone who has uh, lower elementary experience because I don't know that anybody's yet figured that out quite uh, with that in that with a Ned tech. And so there's just been moments where you might think, oh, what do I have to bring but truly just your unique experience as a teacher add so much to the ed tech industry. Excellent. I, no, thank you everyone for, for sharing. Georgia, did you want to finish out on that? Yeah, note? I'd love to just give a really specific example of what Megan mentioned, just being a teacher advocate in an ed tech space. Um, my coworker, um, who is a, also a designer, I think she might be on, on this meeting, um, but she uh, was a former teacher and was working on delightful experiences in our Clever portal. And we had this idea of doing like clever jokes or like putting in fun jokes for our students to kind of laugh and see. And as teachers, when we heard that, we were like, that's a nightmare. That's like a classroom management, like disruption. Like, you know, it'd be, it'd be it's fun engagement for our students, but like, if it's in the middle of a lesson, like it's gonna be so frustrating for our teachers. Um, and the non-teachers uh, didn't, couldn't really quite understand that. But as teachers we were like, I would hate this. I would I would shut down Clever and like not ever want to use it. So I think that's just an example of like how you can be a teacher advocate um, and really have that lens in a tech space. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, uh, Georgia, um, and everyone for for sharing some thoughts on that on that question. I do want to get to some of the questions we're getting a lot from from the audience, and Sarah's going to share some of those in a bit. Uh, just for the next couple minutes, though, um, I wanted to see if we could get into some, some specific kind of recommendations and thoughts and suggestions if there are resources out there, groups that people can, uh, can start taking a look at. And I know we've touched on some things here and there, um, but if folks could kind of share 
you know, maybe there are things, um, skills even in, in that you wish uh, you had had kind of built up before making your transition. And if you could, while you're thinking about this, kind of clarify kind of uh, the the types of roles that you're that you're talking about. Um, I think I think we're kind of throwing around some some jargon there of of content and, and things like that. Um, and and so just kind of. Clar clarification around around product versus design and engineering and, and, and different customer facing roles, um, and with that with that kind of um, with that framework, if you would share any any just suggestions or recommendations, advice that you would give to people uh, starting out in this uh, in this path. Yeah, I'm going to take two seconds at the beginning because engineering is is more is specialized. Right? And so in order to go into engineering, you have to have that training and that background. So anyone who is considering engineering, um, the best free resource that you can use is called Code Academy. Um, it's an online tool. You can go and it, it's interactive. It'll teach you a little bit of code and then you'll apply that little bit of code. Um, it's a really, really excellent tool to see if that's something that might be fun for you. And it's in really small chunks. I'm all about the small chunks, really small chunks. So you can do like five or 10 minutes at a time and that's fine. Um, you know, the type of people who like engineering, you know, it, I tell people it's like solving puzzles. I solve puzzles all day long. There's always going to be a solution, right? There's an answer for everything, um, which I really enjoy. So that's my plug for Code Academy, um, super career specific resource for you there. Thank you, Galen. Yeah, I'd also love to give a really specific career resource um, <laughs> for those looking into going to design. Um, one of the, I had never touched a design tool prior to going into tech. And that was one of the um, most difficult barriers for me was I didn't know how to make anything on the computer, which is what designers do. They do more than that, but that's a huge part. Um, and so I would really recommend using a tool called Figma. Um, it's a free um, design tool that you don't need to download any software for. You don't need a credit card to try it. Um, it's just a really easy, lightweight design tool to start exploring. Um, and recently I created some resources for people who are trying to transition to design because um, I'm really passionate about getting people um, free resources to try and learn design. So if you want to just try learning figma.com, um, there are just some free lessons that will walk you through like making uh, very simple things. So Figma is F-I-G-M-A. Awesome. I have some, this is more general and not towards a specific role within tech, but I think is really important to note. One thing that's been really foundational for me in working in tech is community. And I think if you identify as a person of color or come from a historically underrepresented group, um, notoriously tech has not been uh, the most diverse place. I'm just gonna put it out there. It's still not today. There's a lot of work to do. I will say, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of people of color, myself, Latina, who I wanna see more Latinx people in tech. So I'm always wanting to bring more people in. One place where I've seen that done in a virtual setting uh, for Latinx folks is Tequeria. It's an online community, mostly run through Slack that has job boards. Um, and you can also talk uh, with folks who identify as Latinx that work in different roles within tech. Um, the other is Latinas in tech um, who also have a similar online community. I would also recommend people of color in tech. Uh, they post a lot of events and community forums to talk and ask questions. And then lastly, um, Afrotech. Uh, that is an annual conference, but if you go on their webpage and get into some of those networks, you will find communities of folks um, that you can reach out to that uh, can talk to you about sort of the cultural aspect of it, but also give you some advice on specific roles in a space that might feel safer or more comfortable. Yes, yeah, so I, I would say to clear up, I guess, a little, a little jargon, right, and then get specific for what uh, Eric was mentioning is, you know, I heard people talk about so far like customer success, um, you know, client engagement, like those are all roles. So my role as an education strategist, those are all roles that touch school districts, right? So when we're talking about working at like an ed tech company, you know, that is definitely uh, one thing to sort of be aware of. Uh, and what has been really important for that and skills to work on or specific things to keep in mind is 
you know, present uh, presentations at conferences, you know, constantly be submitting, even if they're very local conferences, you know, get used to speaking in front of adults, uh, because we're all very used to speaking in front of children, which oddly enough, if you talk to people that I work with who weren't in education, they're mortified to talk in front of children, totally comfortable in front of adults. It's the total opposite for educators. So get used to talking in front of adults. Uh, try to, so try to find those conferences um, and keep those relationships alive for those people that you meet there. Don't just make it, this is what I did that one day at the conference. So folks that you're presenting near, folks that had a message that really resonated with you, reach out, stay in touch with those people. Um, so relationships and presentation skills are, are huge for jobs like customer success, education strategist, client engagement, all those types of roles where you're going to be working with school districts because you have to be able to present yourself as a leader to those districts with confidence. I would also say for resources, uh, one of the biggest uh, barriers for me getting started was jargon, uh, buzzwords, just understanding the language of tech. Um, I think one of the best things that I found was, first of all, uh, find a company you're familiar with, um, go to their kind of either their people page or their career page, see what kind of roles they are and just start Googling those roles. Like what is the head of product? What is, you know, a, a UI or UX designer? Start Googling those words and learning about them. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend is if you are a little more uh, experienced or know a little more about the tech industry and kind of have uh, a, a role in mind, um, I would recommend either a boot camp um, or something similar, some kind of more formalized class. Just the caveat, some of those could be very expensive, so you don't just want to sign up on a whim and you know it not be for you. Um, I eventually, when I learned, uh, kind of found that product was really where I wanted to get at some point, I took a course at General Assembly. Um, so there's, there's, there's courses out there if you have an idea of how to chart your, your, where you want to go. Um, and that course really taught me that language that I needed to know in order to, to speak effectively to my peers at work. Um, and the last thing I would say that like the biggest thing I wish I had been doing that anyone can do is start leveling up on the things that you use every day, like Google Docs, Google Sheets, Excel. Start just like learning everything you can about that because if I had just come in with, been a master at like Google Sheets, half of my, I would, you know, I, I would have been so much more successful in my early uh, stages at work. So just start like trying new things, even if you don't need to use them in the classroom, but you're gonna find, especially if you use a lot of G Suite, I assume a lot of you do now, that's gonna be just like super transferable. So like level up that experience, learn how to use formulas and sheets, like just, just like level up. Yeah, and I would say if you're thinking about going into sales and or customer success, I'd my recommendation is that 99.9% .9 of companies use Salesforce. You can actually find free Salesforce courses online. I secretly don't like using Salesforce, but it has been necessary in every tech job I've had, um, small startup to a big tech company like uh, customer success and sales, really valuable to take a course on how to use Salesforce. Just Mostly free quick, online. Bill, quickly off something that Doug said about building your network, right, and relationships. Um, that is useful no matter what industry you're trying to get into, right? Find someone who has the job that you want and reach out to them. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say no. Actually, the worst thing is going to happen is they're not going to respond, which to be fair, does happen sometimes. That's okay, right? But more often than not, they are going to be very willing to sit down and chat. You know, I talk with one to two people every week who just want to know about engineering or want to know about how to go from being a teacher to being an engineer. Um, it is it's so worth trying, right? You get some information, you build a relationship, um, and my my extra plug there is it's significantly more meaningful if you're reaching out to this person for advice and not like for a job, you know, like reach out because you want to learn from them, right? Um, it, it's incredibly valuable. Just shoot your shot, like Leanne said earlier, right? You just reach out and see where where you can get with them. And I'll just love a plus to that. Make sure you follow up if they do. Um, if, cause I'm happy always to rec, um, a lot of tech companies, um, we can do referrals, um, and that can help with your application process. If, you know, make sure to follow up, especially if someone's giving you a referral, because you never know, like 
there's people on this call I'm saying like, I know you from here, I know you from there because we followed up uh, with one another. So always make sure to follow up, um, particularly if you've gotten a referral. Cause we like to see, we are, we want to know what happened. Like, um, especially if we've spent time with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to add to that. And when you do reach out, um, I think it's really helpful if you have specific questions. Cause oftentimes when you reach out and you're just like, oh, I want to get to know you. It, it helps the person really like uh, be able to point you in a specific direction. So whether it's about learning specific skills or wanting to hear that, that person's background, just think about specific questions you could ask. Um, and I think that goes to the interview process as well. If you do get an interview, like really research the company and come with specific questions because it shows that you've, um, you know, you show interest in this particular company. You're not just like throwing out your resume um, to a batch to see what happens. Um, and yeah, I, I think following up is super essential. I actually met a very good friend at an ed tech event. And um, I think that through just, you, you'll be surprised that like, having a tribe of fellow teachers with you in tech can really be affirming and help you to still feel connected to the mission and really um, just help you in, in making that transition. So definitely um, initiate those conversations, follow up, and you'll be surprised you'll like end up making a lot of friends along the way. Great. These are all great recommendations. Uh, yeah, don't, don't hesitate to, to reach out to folks build those networks. I think these are, these are just excellent, uh, excellent pieces of advice wherever you're, wherever you're ending up at. Um, I had just one more kind of question that I personally wanted to, to hear from maybe just a couple people before we, before we pop over to some audience questions. But um, for, for anyone on the panel, uh, if, if one or two people want to answer, what do you still find fulfilling in your current role? Uh, how do you still feel connected to education despite being out of uh, the, the school or district context? And anyone can, can hop in on this one. Well, first of all, all of my students added me on Instagram. So I figured I was like past the point where I was not okay with that. And now like, sure, you're an adult, you're going to college. That's wild. You were 12. You know, um, so that's fun. It's fun to keep in touch with them every now and then they reach out. Um, but for me, you know, as an engineer, I think I'm, I'm pretty far removed. Um, so what I like to do is I like to go to user research. You know, we do user research sessions all the time for, for deciding what we're going to build next, right? And we get a teacher in, we get a student in, we get a parent in, and we have them use like a fake version of our app to see how they interact with it. And I love going to those. You know, I love going to those and sometimes being able to say, I told you so to designers who weren't listening to me that the student definitely was going to click that, you know, um, and it's a way to see people interacting with my product still. Um, it warms my heart. I get to hear little voices, you know, that's always fun hearing like the little tiny, especially the elementary school kids. They're so cute. Um, and so that that's one of the ways that I still stay super connected. Awesome. They'll do quite a bit of tutoring um, and in uh, both because I need it to fill my soul and my love of the of education and, and kids and I need that connection, but also because I use I excel when I'm tutoring to find out what's going to account. It's like a what Galen's saying, it, but I just me created it, but I created it, but you know, the, um, so I, I get, it gives me a chance to see the pain points and see where the students are going to enjoy it and where they're going to hate it and what they're going to complain about and what they're going to get really excited about that you didn't expect and different things like that. And so that's been neat to continue the tutoring piece. And then also I knew that for my soul, I needed a pretty consistent touch point with teachers and principals. So I looked for a job that would have that when my whole job is professional development with teachers and principals. And because of that, then it's led to moments where I've gotten to now go and visit teachers classrooms who have really strong implementation and then see the students or I'll do a Zoom call with a classroom and I get to be the lady from IXL that's like, oh my gosh, I saw your growth, you know? And it's just really neat. And then they get to at pepper questions, but it gives me this moment of back in the classroom type of feel. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I found that right now that's good. That's all I need. It fills the cup. Um, but it's just been a really neat opportunity, but I knew that I needed that. So that's the job I looked for. 
I love that, Megan. I, I, I want to cut us off there. I know we might have had some people wanted to share a little bit more there. Sarah, do we do we have some questions from the audience that you want to go into? I know we we received a, uh, a lot there, so let's let's hop into those. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of questions. Um, I'm trying to put some together in different themes, but a, a big thing that people want to know about, obviously, is what is your day to day like? Um, you know, teaching is so structured and. You don't have a lot of breaks, um, and I, I think that's a big change for people. So, uh, if anyone could could talk about that, and you know, what what does your day look like, and what are some things you enjoy about it? Um, I'll say that. So my day, I mean, you're pretty much looking at it right now, <laughs> especially uh, over the last nine months. Uh, you know, I am coming at you live from my bedroom, so I am in this room of the house for like 20 hours a day, um, but. I think more importantly, because my work is with school districts, it's a lot of uh, calls, it's a lot of communication. So whether it's phone calls, video calls, email, pre-pandemic, it was 50% uh, travel. So uh, covering three states, it was a lot of travel around the state of Florida, specifically, that's where I live. Um, and then monthly to Georgia and probably quarterly up to Tennessee. But so just a lot of um, interfacing with people in whatever that looks like. Uh, and that's probably the, the biggest thing. And, and then when it's project-based instead of the actual calls, then it's, you know, at, at the desk. So I, I can use the bathroom almost whenever I want though, which that was new. Yes, that's the best. <laughs> Um, for me, I'll talk about uh, I'll talk about pre-pandemic life in the office. Um, so obviously, it's going to depend on your company. It's going to depend on your role, um, and it's going to depend on what your company is working on in that exact moment. So when I first started at the Coursera, it was um, it was a very heavy uh, meeting-focused uh, company. We were planning a lot. We were collaborating a lot. We were kind of trying to figure out what the direction of my specific department was going to be. So I spent a lot of time working with my peers, discussing ideas, brainstorming, um, coming back to the to the to the drawing board. Um, and then, other than that, I, I think the biggest impact on me other than being able to go to the bathroom when I wanted was just kind of like, they don't lie about the tech world in my experience. Like the perks of the tech world are in, in, bougie and insane. So um, for example, we had like eight types of coffee where we had fight over a pot of Folgers at my school. So it like those things are definitely a huge difference, but kind of like the day in and day out, it was very flexible. My company is huge on work-life balance. Like the thought that I didn't have take-home work was insane. Like I didn't know what to do. I was like, I don't have eight hours of work to do when I get home tonight. So that was, I mean, my company is really focused on that. Um, just as collaborative as teaching. Um, a lot of, I mean, you do spend a lot of time in front of the computer, obviously. Uh, my office was open space, so you don't have a private you know, like area, uh, we didn't have cubicles, we just had standing desks that worked really well for me because I'm more of a, a social person, but um, I'd really research the, the culture and the work environment of any company you're looking into just to make sure it aligns with your personal preferences for, for how you like to work. Yeah, I'll add there, um, all similar to, to how you all are working now in the pandemic. Uh, my role involves meeting with people across a lot of different time zones, colleagues in Australia, Japan, Europe, like Argentina, uh, externally and internally. So teams at Twitter, but then also different universities and um, researchers across the world. So one thing for me and to note in a role you're looking at is like time differences. Uh, Cause you know, it's not, it's not, it, I love my job and it's super interesting. I love talking about research and policy. Uh, but it is, you know, when you have to wake up at 3, 4, 5 a.m. to meet with someone in Australia, it can be a little challenging. So I would say that's one of the big differences is I'm kind of always on because uh, we're a global company. Thanks. Uh, and then I think we might be able to do one more um, before before closing yeah. out just to respect everyone's time. But uh, I, a couple people are asking, what are the trends that you're seeing in ed tech in terms of both in terms of product, but in terms of growth and hiring. Um, if you have any thoughts on this, 2020, the big article came out today, 
was a huge year for ed tech investments. Over $2 billion were invested in ed tech companies. And so what are your thoughts on that? And, and what have you been seeing at your companies or just in the world of ed tech in general? Diversity and inclusion. Uh, I won't get into the specifics as to why, but I think this past year, now more than ever, a lot of companies are waking up to the fact that we can't continue to operate foundationally like this because of the impact that we do inevitably have on the world. And I'd say that's pretty true from startup, small company to big tech. So with, with that being said, I would encourage folks, because I think something that's a unique skill potentially to a lot of people that are listening to this call is if you have experience in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, whether that's consulting, facilitating critical race theory, um, that is a growing area that we're seeing more investments in. And I would encourage you to take a look at that and argue that you have very special skills that uh, can really uh, make a big impact in a lot of companies. Yeah, another trend um, that I think we're seeing right now is the pandemic has been a forcing function. You know, I think that schools have traditionally been behind when it comes to tech, and now we're living in a world where they can't anymore, right? Which has created a lot of opportunity. Um, and you see a lot of companies working their way into the space that Zoom would never have looked at ed before, right? And now Zoom has an entire education like platform um, because they recognize that this is an important space. So you see a lot of schools and districts kind of realizing that they have to give this attention, right? And realizing that they don't know enough about it, right? Um, so we're seeing kind of a boom in that regard. I still see a lot of um, expansion in uh, the creation of content as well. So whether it's videos, uh, study guides, learning materials, um, uh, question and answer pairs, uh, we in, in our kind of niche industry are still seeing a large expansion in that content uh, creation and development. Um, I think communication is extremely important now that um, teachers, students, um, parents are all not able to see one another. Um, so I think that that's a huge investment. Um, and yeah, I think just being able to, um, I think at first when everyone suddenly moved to, um, you know, distance learning, there was an a huge focus on equity and accessibility to devices, but now it's really about what does achievement look like in a distance learning um, environment. And so I think a lot of ed tech companies are really thinking about like, how do we understand what success in learning actually looks like, um, you know, now that students aren't in a classroom traditionally. Great, thanks everyone. And I do have one more quick question because we've been talking so much about networking and connecting and just reaching out. And a few people have asked if it's okay to add you on LinkedIn. Um, so I figured that would be the answer, but a lot of teachers don't have a LinkedIn. So if you don't, that's a great place to start. And um, you can look up all these panelists you know, using the information from the, the invite. So um, yeah. Thanks. That's the last one, Erica. I'll turn it over to you. To close Thank out. you so much. That's a great. That's a, a great recommendation, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that. And yes, I am definitely happy to connect with folks. We're going to be sending out an email with resources uh, from the speakers uh, and the Remind Careers page, where you can learn more about our open roles, our commitment to creating a diverse, equitable, inclusive workplace. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending this meeting. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for taking time to share uh, your experiences with all of us. Uh, I, I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I think to love working with educators and former educators, um, but one of the best is their willingness uh, to share their experiences and passions with, with those kind of seeking to learn. Uh, you know, I, th I think we're, we're all in this work together. Uh, it's great to be together as a community today and to learn more uh, about the various ways to impact students and the education system in general, uh, whether you're in education or in ed tech. So uh, yeah, we're, we're just over, uh, over time here. So uh, we'll close out now, but thank you and good night, everyone. Thanks y'all. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you.